All right. Welcome to the sixth episode of Pick Your Brains. And um, this is the sixth and final episode of season one. <laughs> As if like there's so many seasons. But then it's just um I'm I've been really, really blessed to have such amazing people on the first few see first few episodes on, on this podcast, which I started completely honest because of coronavirus and um i wanted to be a little bit more productive and creative and what better way than to really go into the minds of people whom i admire and respect and uh, friends that i have developed along the way and you know what it's really quite i'm i'm quite lucky and blessed to have forged relationships with um, colleagues in the past two years and with people whom I truly, truly admire. And this man in, in particular, our, our friendship uh, deepened throughout the tour of The King and I, but then it was really such a remarkable thing watching him work. And I think um, just seeing him in the, in the rehearsal process, um, he is the only Caucasian actor, uh, Caucasian male actor, in the whole King and I story, apart from Mrs. Anna, he plays all of the Caucasian male characters and his characters, ironically, I, I am second cover of. Um, but it was so nice to watch him uh, just flesh his characters out. And on paper, it seems like he doesn't do much in the show, but then that was not something that he found to be a limitation in his process. And I just, I admired how he dove in into his process, into his work, and just watching him even from the wings and just seeing him work was so admirable. And it was something that I felt that I wanted to aspire to be as an actor, whether your, your role is big or small on paper and whatever you contribute to the whole narrative and the story, there's always a process that you need to undergo. And so much respect for this guy and it was, on a train trip from one of our venues to London that I really, really got to go into his mind. And whatever respect I had just grew even deeper. And I, I love talking to this guy and I'm so excited to have him on my podcast. And we, we're gonna be talking about a whole lot of things, um, particularly also um, our love for filmmaking. And we're gonna be showing a little short film that he had directed when he was part of the original cast of the West End's uh, the Jersey Boys. And we're gonna be talking about more on that and his teaching of uh, a method called the signs of acting, which also blew my mind and living on a boat and just being an all around cool guy. Like when I grow up, I wanna be Phil Bullcock. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Bullcock. <laughs> Hello, thanks Joaquin. What a you great like introduction. <laughs> I should have paid you another 50 quid. It would have been even better. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. How are you? How are you doing, brother? I'm doing I'm doing very well, you know, all things considered, uh, you know, um, with the current climate. But, uh, yeah, I'm doing very well and, and enjoying it as much as I can, being in this different situation where, you know, you kind of spend a lot of time at home with your family. So that's great because, obviously, before that, on tour, Right. I was away from my family a lot and things do change when you're an actor and you have children and going on tour is um becomes a different deal something you jump at when you're you know you're younger right. and you know in in with not so much responsibility you know tour great fantastic you know I've sp you know when I was younger and and, and single and all that you're like yeah great <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I want to go on tour all the time. Right. But, uh, as you get older, it's and and obviously family stuff. I, I I was really in two minds about doing it, but I'm really glad I did because I had a wonderful time. And uh, and this seems like catch up time for me now, back with the right. family, and um, I'm I'm enjoying it a lot. I mean, despite the the gloom of COVID and just this horrible pandemic that's surrounding the world right now, I'm sure it was a pleasant um, break for you to spend a lot of time with Annabelle and Otis. Yeah, well, it it is, and um, you know, he's uh, my my son is is only four. He was j just turned four actually last week. Yeah, it was last week, oh, last nice. on the sixth of July, which is my birthday as well, which is uh, which is great. Well, <laughs> I remember people coming to me going, "Oh, now your your birthday is going to be overshadowed because it's Otis's birthday," but it's quite the opposite. <laughs> Everyone remembers my birthday because they remember his. So um, <clears throat> it's like works out pretty well. Excuse me. Um, 
but uh yeah i mean i'm enjoying being with them we 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 were lucky we because we live on a boat there's lots of upsides to living on a boat there's some downsides and, and one of that is that you don't we're in a marina and uh, we have a pontoon and um we don't have any outside space really but just before lockdown happened, we managed to bag an allotment in the local kind of uh, parish. Exactly. And uh, that's yeah. been... Okay, tell, tell us about this allotment, um, how you guys are taking care of it and growing everything that you need to eat on the table. You just grow it out. There. Yeah, well, we, we kind of... We, we... Oh. Sorry, I, lo I lost you. I lost your audio for a bit. Hang on. Philip, you need to unmute yourself. I think you muted yourself. I can't hear you. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Perfect. Okay, tell me about, about the allotment. I can't hear you. Oh, I can't sure. hear you now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, I'll carry on my story and I'll yeah. see what uh maybe it's your end i don't know i've just unmuted my mic anyway sorry about that um yeah anyone looking for an allotment you can go on the council website two-year waiting list all that stuff you have to wait for um ages and uh, put your name on the list but the best thing is is to try and go straight to the people that run the allotment because we we were told it was two years to wait and then we okay. went past and got some details called the people emailed the people that are in charge of it and the day after we got an allotment <laughs> which is the day after and it was about three days before lockdown happened how big and how big can you confirmed and okay. um and it's it's the grand sum of seven pounds a year mm -hmm. for um for quite a big piece of land and we just doubled it in size actually because we got the plot next to us as well i think that was down to my wife's hard, hard work because she she really she really jumped into it and um and it turned out she's got a, an amazing knack with it. And yeah, we've got gooseberries and blackberries and loganberries and chard, spinach, cauliflower, broccoli, um, red currants, uh, raspberries, um, butternut squash, courgettes. <laughs> and everyone was telling her, saying, don't try and do too much. Don't take on too much. Just do one or two beds, but she's done everything. And, uh, and it's all yielding, you know, bounteous fruit and vegetables which is great so uh can you, yeah. can, you hear me? can you hear me now no i can't hear you no i don't what's that oh, about hang on. hang on oh hang on a minute hang on i think i know what's going on here it's uh i don't know why i did that mm, okay hang on hang on i will hear you shortly does it work now okay does it work now if you speak now it should be okay check one yeah. two one can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Ah, perfect. Sorry, Joaquin. No worries. There you go. No worries. All right. So you're 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 planting your own vegetables, loads of stuff on yeah. the element. Does that go straight to the table? Is that you don't grow yeah. anymore? Uh, no, no, it goes straight to the table. We we, we um we've had everything I mentioned. I think apart from the butternut squash and the pumpkin, uh, we've had at the table and eaten. Which has been fantastic, and Annabelle's a great cook. You know, she she was um, she's an actress uh, principally, but and, yeah. and obviously a mum now. But um, she um, she's a fantastic cook. In fact, she's she's got a, she's got a, pre a cooking agent that represents her for presenting. No cooking. way! Yeah, she did some stuff for the BBC. She's presented at the ho Ideal Home exhibition at um, Earl's Court or wherever it was, or Olympia, I think it was that time. And um, she's a fantastic cook, so I'm I'm really really lucky. <laughs> Because I'm rubbish. <laughs> I, I still owe you a whole loaf of um, sourdough bread in exchange for some vegetables from the allotment. So. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the deal. I, I'm, I'm very willing to do that deal because your bread is looking very, uh, very nice on your Instagram <laughs> posts. So yeah, you, whatever you want, gooseberries, raspberries, blackberries. Well, you have to tell me. So, how does a guy who's worked with the, who's worked on the dark knight who's worked on the original cast of jersey boys on west end end up just living on a boat like i mean that's such a massive this you've been you 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 pretty much have everything going for you in the city life like you, you can live in central london you can do whatever you want how does how is that what goes into your mind for you to just be isolated and just be you know in your small space in the boat 
Um, I think it was um, it was practicality, really. A lot of practicality yeah. went into it because uh, we were living in the last place we lived in London was in Oldgate, which is Zone One. It was like at the at the at the end of Brick Lane, the right. slightly the slightly rubbishy end of Brick Lane. One ends like in you know up near where um, you know Bethnal Green is and everything. That's the cool end, and we were at the other end. Uh, we had a very nice flat, and and it was opposite one of the one of Jack the Ripper's kill sites <laughs> so we had the jack the ripper tour going going under our window you know twice a day which was quite funny um but um it was it, it, it we wanted to move out we knew we wanted children we didn't want them to grow up in that area because it's um you know it, it's a lot of great things going on there it's, it's got a great vibe but you know there's a lot of stuff that you don't want really kids to see happening to yeah. And uh, we thought countryside would be good. We looked at various places around, you know, around London. Um, and the commute in was just as expensive as having a flat. You know, it made as, ex as expensive as renting in, in central London. And we've, I've always rented, you know, I've lived in about 30 different places in, in central London. Um, so we just thought, what's an alternative? And I'd, I'd had, a, had a mate who had a, a small boat that I'd lived on for a couple of months. And then in Jersey Boys, I met Glenn Carter, who people listening to this m might well know. Um, and, and he'd lived in Li the Limehouse Basin for a long time on a boat. And, uh, you know, like he was, he's someone that I, I, I got to be great friends with. And um, and that kind of inspired me to, to look at it as well. I, I said it to Annabelle, I said, you, should we have a go at it? And we were in Little Venice, which is a beautiful part of, of London. A lot of boats moored there. And we saw a guy with an advert in the window saying um, boat for rent for six weeks, I think it was. And he was going off to um, Ecuador for six weeks. And uh, so we knocked on the window and, and we went in. He, he was there and um, he said, yeah, the boat, if you'd like to, to, ha to have it for six weeks. He said, I've been offered three, four times what I want in rent. But at the yeah. time, we, we just we, we'd reserved the leisure mooring at a marina outside London because we, we were getting quite serious about getting a boat. And because he, he knew we had that mooring, he right. said, I'll sail my boat to that mooring. And if, if you keep it on that mooring, you can have the boat for nothing. Wow. Because, because it will just be safe there. And I know it will be safe there. So that's what we did. The boat was very old. He was a lovely guy. A woodsman, it turns out. He was a, a woodsman. Uh, that was his profession. Smoked a pipe with some very, very strong smoking tobacco that kind of permeated even the steel of the boat it was so strong the smell um but, but we, we we lived in there over a severe winter it must have been winter 2015 i reckon yeah 2014 it was really heavy winter it was freezing the boat wasn't really built well it wasn't insulated well you know i was going to be in q and buying buying big boards of polystyrene and cutting it to shape and like slotting it against the door to try and keep us warm um and but we we did it and annabelle cooked on it she there was a there was like a log burning stove that she would cook stews on like in, in a huge casserole and she said um yeah i'll do the boat thing but there's one thing we have to have and the boat has to be well insulated and it has to have an amazing system for cooking you know because she's into a cooking so in the end we had one built we looked for one second and we couldn't find one we liked or that was in a fit state because you have them surveyed just like you do a house yeah if you're wise, some people don't. They don't bother paying for survey, which I wouldn't recommend because you can really end up with a with a real lemon on your on your hands and lots of money. Because boats, uh, boats, it's a it's a bit of a fallacy that they're a cheap option. They're not really. Um, you've got to spend a lot of money on them um, in certain ways. But anyway, we we had one built and uh, a part built, and I, I Annabelle and I set about finishing it. But then she got pregnant with Otis, so so it's still waiting to be finished as you can see from stuff like yeah. this which is this is the porthole behind me which is that's that's a bright porthole from amsterdam i don't even see it but the, there's a liner that's supposed to go in yeah. there it, we actually have but i haven't fitted it yet so right. so all stuff like that needs to be done and I, I do enjoy doing practical work you know i like doing woodwork and stuff so a bit like daniel day lewis and his shoemaking you know philip bullcock and his um woodworking quite quite less well known but <laughs> Is it is it a drastic adjustment? I mean, just living in the city, living with all the people around you, easy access to whatever you know commercial needs that you need, and just uh, being like a master of your little own space. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, 
the thing is, is that the other thing that's really practical about it is that we're mortgage free, you know, we don't have a mortgage. So, mm. and as an actor, I think you, you have anything like that hanging over your head and it forces your hand to make decisions you don't want to make. You know, I've always really enjoyed the freedom of not having to do certain jobs if I don't want to do them. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a mortgage, you know, and it was very tempting in when I was doing Jersey Boys, you know, you're getting paid really well, you're getting paid every week. Mm. You know, you look at your, you know, I'm starting to smile remembering those times. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the, you go to the, the hole in the wall and you just see the, the money adding up and you go oh, this is incredible and uh i did go and look at a few flats and i nearly bought one um it didn't in the end that was in bethel green actually it was a basement flat didn't buy it um but if i had i would have had a mortgage and then yeah. you kind of i would have probably stayed in jersey boys a lot longer which i think would have been detrimental for me as a person because after the second year i thought you know I can see the show isn't what it was when it, when it, when it first started, it was an incredible um, feat of, of, um, of theater and, 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 you know, theatrical endeavor because everyone was really on it. They didn't know if it was going to work in London. They didn't want to take any chances. So you've got the whole creative team, every single member of the cast, it's just the dot and all the I's crossing all the T's, all the detail is there, all the care and attention to, um, as I say, the detail and conscientious work is there. As soon as it's a commercial hit, then that starts to wane. And, you, mm. and, and if you've been in it from the start, and if you're lucky enough to be part of an original cast, and that was the first time I, I was part of an original cast, you kind of see yeah. it decline. And 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 from one stage, it gets a bit. It, 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 it's just it's just not as enjoyable in in, in the end. And and. Uh, I think after two years I was ready to go, but I had I had a mortgage hanging over my head. I probably would still be in it. <laughs> let's, let's let's go a little bit backwards. Let's go rewind to the start of Jersey Boys. Like, um, what was your process getting into the company, and what what was your how did you audition for it, and was it everything yeah. you expected it to be? Yeah, I, I mean, I I was very lucky. I was in that position that you want to be in when you're auditioning, which is I was working, so I was doing a film called um, curses and sermons with with a guy who's now i've done four films with him and he's he's knitting them together into a feature film called uh um queen of the redwood mountains it's called and it's all they're all based on beat poets but i i was doing that was our very first collaboration which was c called curses and sermons by um it's based on a play mm -hmm. by a, a a poet writer playwright called michael mcclure and the play's called the beard um, it was very controversial. If any of your listeners um, or people watching this uh, look it up, it was a very controversial controversial play when it was first put on. Um, the cast getting arrested and stuff. Anyway, I've, I've, uh, wow. I've provoked your interest with that one, so you can go and find out about that. <laughs> but anyway, I, was do, I was doing that film. We were we were filming in a, in a quarry in Reading, and I was playing a cowboy, which was like my dream role. You know, I'd like it was great, <laughs> it had amazing costume, had the guns and everything. It was brilliant. I was playing Billy the Kid, actually, or a character based on billy the kid and uh and i was literally coming into the auditions having to get back to set so i had to be as quick as i possibly could and having to explain to them every time i went in that listen i've, I've got to be quite quick you know so that you know you, they've got the casting assistant outside say so i've really got to get out of here as quick as i can because i've got to go so you just go in you just do the job and you leave you don't second guess anything you don't yeah. mess around you just go in there be professional do the job get out and yeah. uh, didn't really have time to think about it. And and plus, there was some other things that really helped. Was my agent totally undersold it. He said, that I've got this audition for you. It's for this like musical thing. It's a do what musical, and it's doing okay in, in, <laughs> in, in New York. <laughs> and I was like, all oh, right, okay. I was like, okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Yeah, let, let, let's see what happens. <laughs> and I think the other one as well, the other thing that kind of like really kind of broke the audition ice, you know, that kind of tension that you have when, you, when you're too – when you care too much about it, if you know what I mean. I mean, I, you should care about auditions, absolutely. But when you go in, you've just got to get into the character. You know, you've got to think the character's thoughts. You've got to be relaxed. But when I was doing the choreography, I split my trousers. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that was uh, that was something that just you just go, oh, you know. And it, I think it just made me relax. So I was I was always quite relaxed going into the auditions, just going in, not expecting anything. Not so. So you yeah. booked the job, you booked the job, and yeah. you played the most musical Jersey boy, the one who doesn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he was the, 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 the musical genius of the four. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't say anything. And you were talking to me about um, how 
I, I don't know if you, if you want to share everything with everybody listening, but then you were talking to me about how you pretty much broke through something in terms of how to perform this particular character. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think it's always tricky to play a character that I remember when I was auditioning for it, I was first up for Tommy, which is the guy who gets the band together and is the leader of the guy and is the most loquacious of them. You know, he's the one that's just talking all the time. The main narrator, right? The first. Yeah, he, he's the first narrator. Yeah, he's the one that introduced you. And the one it ended up being Glenn Carter. And, and I think that, that, you know, and it worked really, really well. And, and Glenn did a, did a great job in that role. And um, all the guys were great. I mean, that's another thing that was unusual about that show is we had such a great relationship. Myself, Glenn, Ryan, Stephen, we all still speak. We're all still good friends, um, which is unusual because sometimes with stuff like that, egos can really, you know, mess things up, but it didn't. But I think with that role is is that what, what what's the temptation with it? Because you don't say as much as the other guys and it's like a four-way you know, it's 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 a show. It, it is a show about the four guys and and their individual kind of you know yeah, views yeah. on what happened. Right. But you can start to feel like no one's really looking at me. You know, the other three are saying everything. The other three are doing. It, no one's really taking notice notice of my character. And as soon as you do that, then of course you start doing things that are out of context of the story. Right. And what I tried to do as much as I could was just think what is he thinking now you know what is he what 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 am i thinking as nick now and i just have to hold those thoughts and be in context as much as i can unfortunately the training which i'm sure we'll talk about later yeah. uh, the science of acting really allows you to do that and although i was quiet on stage for a lot of the time i was i was doing my best to stay in context context of the story and 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 have the thoughts of the character as much as possible um and not get into this mindset of i have to do something or i have to i have to yeah. think something so the audience take notice of me because i think that that is that is the wrong way to go that's a trap you can fall into with that that role and it's amazing because you can do as long as you think people don't realize how sensitive as human beings we are to other human beings and thinking i think and that we can you know, we, 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 we pick up people's thinking, you know, when you walk down the street and you catch someone's eye and there's a little exchange of thinking or why people are attracted to certain people and not others. It's because of, of affinities in thinking. And, and even in a 2000 seat theater, you know, people right at the back um, can still kind of pick up thinking just, just from looking at the back of an actor, an actor, an actor, you know, if you're in the context and you're thinking the right thoughts. And I was looking at my son the other day, he was, he was watching something and he was, it was, I think it was some remote controlled cars in, 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 a, in a park and he was quite a way away from me, but just his whole posture and the way that, 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 that his, his back was and, and, and the tensions in his back be, there because of his thoughts, mm. you could see everything. He was so excited. He, he hadn't seen these cars before and he just wanted to, to go and see it. He knew, he knew he couldn't go and see them, but he wanted to go and see them. And I think what I'm trying to say is that Nick, Nick's apart. You just have to go, okay, all I have to do is just, make sure that i'm thinking his thoughts uh and staying in context all the time even though i'm not saying stuff and people do get it and 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 i and i absolutely can you know i can say it works because in the end what what they did is that they, they said to me said yeah we, we don't think that the original nick in, in in new york and um you know there's no disrespect to him but we think you're bringing something else that he he didn't bring. And I think they didn't have as good a relationship, the four of them in, in New York. That's mm. why I heard. So if you don't feel supported as well, I felt really supported by the other guys. I felt that none of them were trying to be the center of attention really, wow. or, or be the one, you know, even Ryan, who who, who was the standout out leaders, Frankie, in, in, in terms of, of, you know, he had all the vocal and everything, you know, those three guys uh, were very, very respectful. I mean, all, all four of us of each other. And um, and I, I felt very supported by them, but they flew over the, the the guy that took over in New York. They flew him over to England to to come and see me do it. Wow! And he came to my dressing room for me to tell him <laughs> to give him tips on how to do it, which was a bit of a surreal moment because I'm like saying, "Yeah, okay, well, this is what I do at this point. And this is what I'm thinking here." And the guy's looking at me like this, and <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking, "This guy's crazy," because I do put a lot of detail into it, which but I think everybody yeah. should but but yeah. people aren't sometimes used to that you know they just go i just get on and, and, and do it you know which i think i used to do 
uh, I used to go on stage and go, you know, I know the lines and the thing, I'll just get on and, you know, I'll do it. But I got, I think I got into a point where I just didn't know whether I was doing a good performance or a bad performance or, or it was left to chance. And right. in the end, I thought, I, I, I want to I want to know that I can do this every night. I want to be able to recreate this every night and, and do as good a job as I can every night. And, and eventually I found a technique that allowed me to do that, which will, I'm sure we'll get onto. But. I was, I was, I'm, I'm privy to that. And I, I'm witness to that. I mean, in, even in the King and I, you come in as Captain Orton at the start and Edward Ramsey in act two. So you have low, you, you're backstage more than you are on stage. Yeah. You're, you're on stage for all but two to three scenes, but yeah. every night and I can vouch for it and I'm not bullshitting anyone. Um, you, you always bring something, you're consistently spontaneous on stage. Um, it's reliable, but always new. And I see you prepare. And I just wanted to ask you, like, you're always right before you enter, you're always in that little corner and you have your eyes closed and you're really focused. Mm. Um, what's going on? What is that kind what is that prep that you go through right before uh, you I, I, Well, it's um basically it's just getting myself into the context of um the time period, you know, the mm. fact that it's um you know 1862 well certainly when the when the king and i opens it's 1862 um and the 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 what people call the backstory um and what in science of acting you call the character line yeah. running through that and running through something else called a mind print which is a mind print is another science of acting term which is really the main thoughts that kind of that um hold the character's consciousness together that's a very basic way of describing it, but it's the main thoughts about people, about life, about sex, about um, it's all the um, thinking, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's all and, and and this thinking, which which is which is a really fascinating thing about the science of acting, and the only technique that I ever came across that talked about this and and uses it as a as a, a mainstay of of the whole um, um, ethos of the science of acting is is it's all invisible thinking. So it's thinking that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis you know i mean i was thinking about this before I, I came on i was thinking you know that life's become so much about what we want people to think we think so like for instance social media and mm -hmm. and and has made life very superficial and you know people shout from the rooftops i do this and i do that and this is what i am and this is what i am and, mm -hmm. and really, that's not really what they think underneath there's something else yeah. um it, it's 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 in it's very particular to every individual what that is and I'm not sure if it's 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 clear when I'm saying it now. It's it, it's something that you have to um, it, it explain. It's really uh, quite in a bit more detail than we've probably got time for here. But yeah, I know. But then when you when you introduced me to it, um, and we, we'll we'll talk about this at length later on. Um, when you introduced me, it really is like an atomic bomb. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that we that there's I think Richard Brake, who's who's an actor who people might know. He's he's um, he's done. He's got one of those um, faces that lends itself to doing a lot of villains, and um, and he was taught by the same um, guy that I was taught by, someone called Sam Cogan, who, who came up with the technique, the science of acting. And Richard Brake has got um, a quote, and um, on one of their uh, marketing, uh, on some of their marketing material, and he says it's the the atom bomb of acting techniques, and it really yeah. is. I remember sitting there, the first thing I did, I'd, I'd done, I was at Mount View, which is known, I was on the first musical theatre course at Mount View, uh, which people might know is, is is a lot, is a pretty well known school, and I was there, and and Sam Kane as a guest teacher, the first class I had with him. I, I basically told him to f off, and I told him that I thought it was a load of bullshit. Um, you know, I was I was a very arrogant, like very special, like you know, young actor. Like you know, I'm, I, I just feel it, man. And um, and then uh, and like literally two months, three months later, I was doing extra classes with it uh, over the top of a pub after right. school had finished. I was that smitten with it because it, it's it, it's incre it's an incredible body of knowledge absolutely incredible and if you're an actor you owe yourself to find out about it whether you practice it or not or whether you study it i studied it for four years in the end or whether you study it for you know you read the book that there's the book um which is a little bit more right? yeah um or or you do a workshop in it um or you do private lessons you know i do private uh coaching with it it's as an actor you owe yourself to know about this technique because it is 
as, as Richard rightly says, it's, it's in the atom bomb of acting techniques, just because I, the first thing I did before I went to the school, uh, the school of the science of acting for four years was I, I did a two week workshop. I just come back from Germany. I think I've been, I've been doing a musical in Germany mm. and, um, trying to apply what I'd learned from the few lessons I'd had at Mount View from the very brief experience at Mount View and not really been able to apply it because I didn't know enough. And I came back from, from there. I did this two week workshop and, and literally it just, you just kind of, Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like real things that, you know, are really obvious about the industry, but people just don't say. Yeah. And, 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 and pe the thing is, is that it, it takes away all the ambiguity mm. And and the thing with that, the acting industry is people like the ambiguity because it's a bit of a, a bit of a smokescreen that you can you can hide behind. You know when when you know I've sat in rehearsals where directors have said to actors, you know, just just you know like a young actor. I did a, a Shakespeare, I did Romeo and Juliet, and and the guy playing Romeo, the, the director said to him, you know, he'd done a speech and the director didn't like it. He said, you know, it just it needs more Scottish mist, which is a weird thing to say because that's you think that'd be like Macbeth, but it needs you know what I mean? It needs no Scottish and the actor goes, Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Scottish of course he's not gonna say I don't know what you mean because it, it, it doesn't want to look stupid. But at the same time it's like, what do you mean? You know, and 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 if that was five different actors, they'd all think you mean something completely different. Right. And and what the science of acting does is it really takes all the ambiguity out of it, which for some people is a bit like <gasps> And it yeah. was for me to begin with. I think that's why I said it's a load of bullshit. You know, it's a load of crap. You're talking rubbish. You know, and the first lessons I had to begin with, it was very threatening, you know, yeah. for me and very challenging. But the more I found out about it, the more I was like, this is like incredible. I can't right. be an actor without knowing this inside out. And, uh, and so that's, that's what happened. It's really also quite psychological, which I think is perfect because I think acting is psychological. It's all about getting into the psyche and understanding how the human mind works, which is so, so interesting. Right, we'll talk more about that later, but tell us about mm. how how your love affair with film came into fruition. Did you like, because you, you're you're also a director for film, yeah. but then you've, you've put in a lot of work as a film actor, one of which, um, of course, um, I have to mention it, is The Dark Knight, um, working with Chris Nolan and, and that, big hollywood film so did i lose you again i think i lost you again sound wise i think i lost you again um try to unmute yourself phil right you can hear me now yeah yeah i can hear you now yeah i can't hear you. i've done the same thing my, my computer seems to be doing something of its own volition i'm not sure why it's doing it uh, there we go. Can you right, hear me? Now? I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, you were saying about um, just talking about the Dark Knight and and going into being a film actor. Uh, was yeah. that something that you you saw yourself headed toward? I mean, coming out from musical theater training. Yeah, you know, I I started off in the National Youth Theatre and I started off just wanting to be an actor. That was it. And then another practical, really, decision when I was at drama school was I I you know I, I auditioned thirteen times for drama schools. <laughs> before i got in yeah over two years like for seven Ooh. different drama schools and I, I i i was so sure that after national youth theater i'd just get in everywhere you know rada lambda guild hall these places i thought i'll get in no worries no problem wow. didn't get in anywhere and mount view was a bit of a late decision because they auditioned late for a for a january intake i think it was and um yeah so i i i i really didn't um didn't start off as a musical theater actor. I, I was in the, I was in the course and they offered, they started the musical theater course and they came to me and said, listen, you can sing a bit. Do you want to do this um, musical theater course? And I looked at the schedule for the, for the, um, the course, particularly in the third year, you know, the third year of drama school is where everyone do, does plays or, uh, or, or musicals or whatever. And if you don't have a big part, you, you know, you spend most of the time down the pub. Uh, or, or that's what that's from my experience. And, um, and I thought, well, in the musical theater course, we had to come in third year. We had to be there every morning and do dance classes and do singing classes. And I thought, well, that's got to be better value for money. And it can't hurt me as an actor to know how to do that kind of thing, yeah. which, it, which it hasn't at all. So I, that's why I did the musical theater course and um, enjoyed doing it. And then you come out and of course there is a bit of a thing like, oh, you do musical theater or mm. you know, I think the first job I got out of drama school was um, Elvis the musical. Um, and then, 
I can't remember what I did after that. I went to Germany and did um, Returns to the Forbidden Planet, another musical. So I ended up doing musicals. That's where the work was. You know, that's where the jobs were. I loved it. Loved applying, you know, the fact that I really, you know, took acting very, very seriously and, and, and wanted to, to be an, an actor as well. And I didn't see it as a limitation at all. And in fact, one of the things that stands out about my, my career, you know, while unfortunately I haven't worked in any genre, you know, really for, for loads of time, you know, that... I, I feel like I've had a stable career. Yeah. I've worked in every genre, which I don't regret at all. You know, I've worked in theatre, film, musical theatre, pantomimes, you know, radio plays. I've done everything, which which, which has been really satisfying from that point of view. Um, and so I always, I never put limitations on myself. You know, sometimes other people do, you know, you know, or you can't do you can't do TV or kind of film because you're a musical theatre actor, you know, it, it, it's the same thing, you know, acting in musical theatre is the same as, as uh, acting on TV. The slight changes of technique, of, of, of technical things, of course, you've got to hit marks. You've got to be aware of cameras. You've got to be aware of sound. You know, it's a different process. Musical theatre obviously has different things. Singing is, 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 is a different thing, but, but, but really at the, at the bottom of it, you're playing a character, you're holding the character's thoughts. That's the same thing. You're just doing it in a different medium. So I never thought it was anything particularly different or or, or challenging. Yeah. Um, the only challenging thing is is overcoming people's preconceptions about what you can and can't do or what you should and shouldn't do, um, which is, you know, can be a bit annoying sometimes, but you just get on with it, don't you? You just go, <laughs> I you can do this. For. <laughs> so you, you tried to, or were you shooting in LA for a long time? Um. I lived in LA for a couple of years after we, after we did, after we finished um, Jersey boys, I, my, my now wife um, and about, um, and I, we sat down and said, what, what do we want to do? And, um, you know, I had some money in the bank and I'd always wanted to go to LA because it was this mystical place that held this mystery for me. And I'm sure it does a lot of people like, you know, that's, that's the kind of Zenith of the entertainment industry. You know, we don't go there and see what it's all about. And, you know, and I, I know I can make it there. I'll be fine. You know, I'll go. And everyone's telling you, don't go until you get a green card. Get a green card. Get a, You've got to have a green card. Don't go on the old one visa. You, you won't get any work. I was like, yeah, we will. We will. Oh, wow. <laughs> we went there. And, of course, we didn't really get um, a lot of work. I think the problem with the old one visa at the time was that people were just buying them. So people with no experience at all were just paying lawyers to sort it out. Yeah. Going into auditions and the casting directors are sitting there going, this yeah. is terrible. And then everyone got tired with the same brush. If you want an O1 visa, you know, they just all thought you were, you know, it wasn't a guarantee that you actually were, as they call it, an artist of extraordinary ability, yeah. which I always yeah. think is funny um, because people were just, were just paying for them and, and, and right. Getting, right. getting getting it fixed up by spending money to get it done. And um, in LA, we mystified quick. Yeah, uh, yeah, it did. Yeah, I think you go there and you realize, yeah, okay. I'm glad. I'm glad we had that experience. We were there for two years. I think Annabelle was there for longer than me because I I kept traveling back to do jobs back in the in the UK and right. um, little things here and there. And um, we had a wonderful apartment there. That was brilliant, actually. We had this apartment with the the, the best the, the guy who did the swimming pool. He 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 kept kept you know the cleaning the, he cleaned the swimming pool and kept the water at a certain you know level with the certain right chemicals and said this pool i he said i service like you know 150 pools this pool is the best pool in la so the water quality is amazing and it wasn't heated you know the americans love heated pools or the people in yeah. la do anyway which is crazy because it's boiling there it's like you, know, you have a cold thing you jump into so i would get up every morning like you know get my swimming trunks on go downstairs this pool was it looked like a you know it's like topaz it was like just this beautiful color of blue and just dive into it that was that was brilliant um and we met some amazing people that we became great friends with um but yeah it did demystify it for me i did a film there i did a film called crossroads which um i played the lead in um it was an american it was an american role um american character but i managed to get that role by convincing them as an american which i've kind of like made a career of convincing people that i'm american <laughs> Um, which has been tricky sometimes. Um, but um, I did that. So that was a really amazing experience. That was an independent yeah. film we shot in Sun Valley um, in a diner called The Pink. No, 
the pink motel is the name of the motel i've seen it in low i've seen it in dexter i've seen it in some other u.s oh. things it's a really well used location and yeah, um, yeah and there, there was a diner next to it and we shot we shot in the diner and i stayed in the pink motel and oh. i kind of realized the rooms were like you know rented out by the hour if you know what i mean and that's like, right i'm getting yeah. happy <laughs> you get fight indeed yeah. um, does that what what eventually ushered you into wanting to be behind the camera and uh, well well the course i did at the, at the the school of science of acting was um was a directing course as well as an acting course i knew that i would want to direct later in 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 my career and um so i i studied it's a four-year course right and it's brilliant because i don't think there's a directing course around that is so detailed and so methodical in its approach and where you learn so much about you know the craft of directing and acting is great but if you're directing it's 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 a step further in terms of you have to understand every character you have to understand all the relationships you know you're not just focused on one character as you are with an actor or or that character's relationships you're focused on you know your your attention has to be on all the characters sorry on, on all the characters on all the um relationships that, that that are going on in the play and um plus the sets you know costumes um yeah. the, the modeling or, or blocking it's called modeling it's science of acting but blocking you know all those things come together to create something extremely um satisfying you know, and fulfilling because it's such a demanding um exercise being a director it's just it's just one step you know it's, it's, it's actually quite a few more steps further than than acting um so i i trained in that um and it's a really brilliantly designed course you start off just doing i think the first thing you do is um a still um which is you just as a director you just go right i'm gonna pick a uh, a set and then i'm gonna build it and that's your first exercise and it has to reflect the character's thinking so i did a I did um, I, uh, cowboys going back to cowboys. I did a ranch hands bunkhouse, which was um, which I did that because I, when I was a kid, I, I one of the houses I grew up in, the kitchen was was um, wallpapered. The wallpaper was like newspaper from the yeah, from the yeah. old west, and it was like that because that's what they used to do. They used to paper the inside of the of the bunkhouses with newspaper to try and keep the cold out. Right um and um so i that was the first thing that i did and then and then after that then you recreate a picture from from um you know from classical period with with characters in and you have to recreate the relationships the actors play the characters and take up the positions in the painting it's a painting um take up and you recreate the painting but there's no dialogue it and then still, still, still. Yeah, it's just still completely still but you have to you have to perfectly recreate the relationship between the characters as you, as you understand it by analyzing it you know some paintings come with real people and you can get a lot of information about them some paintings you just have to use your imagination and say right what would be the most logical thing yeah. that's happened here what would what would be the most logical thing that they think they're thinking at this moment or they're thinking about each other um so that was the next <laughs> thing because in in film school that's the first thing I teach you, which is called mise en scène, like yeah. setting the scene. And yeah, setting the scene. Yeah. So this, the the responsibility of the director is really to set the scene, everything that you place inside a scene. Oh yeah, yeah, it's extremely important. Yeah, and I think people don't realize yeah. that. It's so interesting that it goes, at least in your discipline, it goes even as far as understanding relationships between oh. actors and not oh, yeah. visual understanding of the scene but it goes into that that thinking yeah oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you have to i i did a painting called judith and the holophonies by a, uh it's an amazing painting of it i think it's the best one and it's by a female artist called artemisia gentileschi um and um so i studied about her life you know i i researched her life i researched the story it's a biblical story and um and it's actually the moment she 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 invites uh, I can't remember the, the details of it, but she invites the, the the town is under siege, and she comes out of the town and she invites the the leader Holophanes, who's leading the army, uh, who's putting this town to siege, um, you know, to sleep with her, and they they have a night together, and then in, and then before, as he's asleep, she cuts his head off. <laughs> so it's a pretty violent picture, but um, 
but I did all the, and the blood squirting out of his neck and everything. I mean, it's a really visceral picture painting. Yeah. And I did the blood, it was just, just things like the detail that we had to do and we were encouraged to do on a daily basis. In fact, if you didn't do it, you were really marked down. Yeah. But did, I, I remember I, re, I thought, how do I recreate the blood, you know, spurting out of his neck? How to do it? I can't hang things in midair, you know, on, on fishing wire or something. It looked really odd. So what I did was I, I, I put um, a dog, like a, a a belt around the actor's actress's uh, actor's neck because you couldn't yeah. see it because it was a big beard in the way and then put pipe cleaners and attached ostrich feathers that i trimmed down that look like spraying right. blood and i dyed them red yeah and it looked really really cool in the end i was really <laughs> pleased with it but it's things like that you know yeah. that we were trained to have such an attention to detail that i think when you see directing that goes that far you know when you're looking at a play and every detail has been has been thought about you know they've really thought about what does this say about the character you know what does this costume choice say what does this the way that they move around the stage say what does you know if i put this yeah. pot here you know what does it say about the way they live their life as opposed to and that was really really taken extremely seriously um in the training that i did and um and you and you really un got to understand why because it really you know, makes a totality of the story, and that, that you're trying to tell, and and uh, and augments it. You know, with, with right. those details. So I'm going to go into your mind a little bit more as a director. We're going to be showing you, showing the people watching, a mm. short film that you had directed. It's called yeah. Everybody Knows My Name, shot on 16 millimeter, right? No, it's 35. 35 millimeter. Yeah, 35. Yeah. <laughs> this was. I mean, just why don't you set it up, and then we can. Okay, so this is a film um, called Everybody Knows My Name. Uh, I was inspired to do it when I was in Jersey Boys um, because it's a song that Frankie, the lead character and the, the, the vocalist of the Four Seasons, talks about, but we right. never perform it. And so I thought, I, I, you know, I, should, I would know this song as Nick. So about a month in, I thought there's a bit of a hole in my research there because I would know this song. So I listened to it and I was very inspired by the lyrics to immediately a film idea came into my mind we're going to be showing just the the top part of this film because that so that people can log on to the actual website and you can give me a director's commentary as we're watching okay well this is um it was shot in, in two apartments above the music library very aptly the music library in victoria yeah and um this is setting the scene really so this is the morning after the night before They've been um, partying to various degrees, Tommy and, and Nick. And you were you told me that you shot this whole film in like 24 hours. Or something. Yeah, it was a 20, the shoot was 24 hours, yeah. So from start to finish, uh, 24 hours. And the producer that I was working with at the time was really on my case about health and safety and going, you know, we're really running over. But, you know, it's short filmmaking. You just got to do what you got to do. Yeah, and yeah. um Oh, we ended up with a skeleton crew at the end. There's all there's all references there that, that that Four Seasons fans really get. That says from Brucey, right. you know, we assigned this for, for cousin Brucey. Cousin Brucey is a song by the Four Seasons. Um, oh, okay, cool. yeah. So there's all like these hidden references in if you're a real four, mad Four Seasons fan. Right. Right. And you, uh, thirty-five millimeter. How many rolls of film did you have to buy for it? Yeah, I can't remember. But all I remember is like listening to it ticking through the camera, going. Uh. <laughs> because it's so expensive um when he opens the curtains there's a scream of fans down below that was yeah. done by uh, students at henley college oh, thanks cool. to them um i love I, I really love your sequence yeah he, this is one shot so we wanted to do this one shot which revealed the room to everybody so there i am with a red coat yeah and i'm pretty stressed out there because obviously i'm directing this whole thing and uh, all the you know people that direct and act in stuff you've got to respect it because um it's you've got a lot of responsibility which yeah. i realized doing this so it, we pulled back it, it, this shot took it, ages it, it, this shot took about six hours i can imagine i mean just yeah. lighting it as well yeah I, yeah the, the lighting was done by the dop called um roger roger eaton and um and he did an amazing job with the lighting the lighting's fa fantastic but that pulling back that shot pulling back there a track had to be lifted and everything it was on a, on the dolly and um you know we had a lot of student uh, people helping with the crew and so they weren't that experienced this is a lovely shot as well gorgeous another, another yeah, tracking yeah. shot you get the and now this is going into a separate apartment yeah. 
So we use we use the door frame to cut to a separate apartment where Glenn and, and the girls are. Um, but yeah, it was just we painted the apartment. You know, we had to paint it and, and then paint it back when we'd finished. But we got it for free, which was incredible. Wow. That, that was some good work by um, the producer. Um, so I'm gonna cut right here, so we can talk about the film. Everybody can go see the the film at everybody knows my name dot com. Is it? Yeah, yeah. The links in there, yeah, and a bit about the film as well. Yeah, yeah. And and it's amazing, you know. I mean, I I, I shot it on thirty five because you know digital has its place and it's very very useful and you know phones and stuff and 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 great digital cinem you know cinema photography cameras like you know the, the uh, alexas and stuff are, are fantastic but i always think digital is you know a step too far removed from the human condition you know i think like you know 35 mil celluloid film is like an analog stock of yeah. film and i think it's just so much closer to to us as human beings and it's crazy i i, I showed it at bafta i was really lucky a friend of mine called um leon ockenden who's, who's an actor was showing his short film at BAFTA and he said, Oh, do you want to, do you want to put yours in as well? You can, you can show it. I, you know, I'm, I'm hiring the place anyway, you know, um, if you want to put yours in. And I did. And yeah. people came afterwards and were very complimentary about it. But one of the things they said was, was that shot on film? So people, you know, people yeah. get it. And no. I said, yeah, it's shot on film. I knew it was, I knew it was, you know, there's something magical about film and I understand why it's, it's kind of, you know, not used as much now, although I, th I still think they shoot, you know, I know the Batman films, you know, Dark Knight and the subsequent ones, Chris Nolan always shot on film. Right. I do love the whole the whole aspect of the media, yeah. the message, the medium, and you deciding that a story, a particular story needs to be told via 35 millimeter. Yeah. And plus, I, yeah, I, I knew that it suited it. You know, it's a period piece, you know, it's set in 1965, I think, that, that, that piece. And, and so it's a period piece that demands, you know, or... I thought demanded uh, that kind of treatment in terms of, you know, we could have shot it on digital, but yeah, yeah. 35 mil. And, and I remember, and one of the, one of the deciding factors was I was speaking to Roger before we'd hired him. And I mean, he's a very experienced DOP and he, he, he'd done a feature film called the killing of John Lennon. And he's worked a lot on some massive films on the second units and stuff, you know, and yeah. he's a fantastic photographer. And he said to me, and, and and he was great because he was he was very giving of, of advice while not being dominant. I think I've I've been in situations as actors where you've got young directors or in, inexperienced directors working with DOPs that are very experienced, and the DOP just ends up dominating the entire shoot, and the director just takes the back seat and lets the DOP just have free reign, which I didn't want. You know, I was like, I I interviewed a few DOPs and I said, listen, you know, you've got more experience with the camera, you know more about the shots than I do, you know more about the technical stuff than I do, and how to light it, but I want to have the last say you know I, I want to be advised and then i want to have the last say you know some some younger dops i interviewed you because i thought no, they're not going to do that but roger was like yeah oh absolutely i'll give you advice when you want it i'll, I'll give you guidance when you want it but it's your call and he yeah. was like that on set he was brilliant but one of the things he said to me he said listen he said uh, i said how much do you want how much is your fee you know he said um it's uh three grand a day <laughs> and i literally went what I said okay, okay. He said, but if you do it on um, thirty-five millimeter, he said, uh, I'll take two hundred and fifty quid and a bottle of scotch. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah. I said, okay, it's a done deal. We'll do it on thirty-five mil, and um, and so we did. And I'm really glad we did. I mean, it cost me much, 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 much more in the end. Yeah. Um, I think the whole film ended up being it's in total. It was between about thirteen and fifteen grand, but. You know, I look at it and it's not disposable. So many digital things, you know, it, I mean, it's ended up, it's like, it's a music video. I hate calling it that because it's a music film. But if you look at music videos, you know, or anything going on at the moment, because, you know, things move so fast, social media, blah, 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 all that, you know, digital, the digital medium so disposable. And I wanted it to be something that wasn't disposable, that right. people would look at and it'd stay there. You know, who knows when I'm not going to get the chance to to direct a film. I mean, I'm 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 definitely angling for doing it, yeah. um, and 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 it will happen. But you know, that was probably the last opportunity I get to work on film. So I, I took it and thought, you know, hopefully that will it'll just stand the test of time that people will always enjoy watching it. So I, I, the amount of detail and it, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, in the nine minutes, even if it is a music video, it really yeah. is. A film. 
And just the amount of detail that you put into your process as an, as an actor, the technique that you put into your process as an actor is very evident as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's really, I'm really grateful for you saying that, and it's, it's it, and it, and people do get it. You know, I mean, not not everyone's going to come to you every day, and you don't do it so that people come and say that's brilliant, you're brilliant, or everything. But, but and of course, when people compliment you, you, you take it. Um, and I think sometimes it can be a little bit disheartening when you're putting a lot of detail into doing loads of research. You know, like the King and I, for instance. I did loads of research on Orton. I did loads of research on Victorian times. I did loads of research on Cy, you know, Siam at the time, and 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 looked at all the details. You know, what the money would be worth now, and the money they're talking about. How much do I get paid? You know, what how how long I've been, do, you know, <clears throat> living this life as as a sea captain, as Captain Orton. You know, all the aristocratic stuff and the and the political stuff with with um, Ramsay and stuff. And you come off stage, and I think every now and again, I think you know no one really notices it you think because yeah. no one really says it because it's a minor i'm a i'm a minor contribution really to to the those characters are a minor contribution compared with with, with a lot of others characters in that show but actually it's it, it th that doesn't matter and, and i remind myself you know I, you know I remind, that, that doesn't matter what matters is if you're doing anything i mean anything you know whether you're a painter and decorator or or you're working on an oil rig or, or you're being an actor or you're being a doctor, whatever. If if you're not striving to understand and 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 really approach your job with every detail, you know, our profession is 70% of our life. If yeah. you're not putting everything into it, what's the point? Yeah. You know, what's the point? What's the point of doing it? You know, you, you, there's no point. So, and particularly acting, because it's so enjoyable, you know, it's so great to use your brain and and you can you can never stop researching one character. You know, I could I could spend my whole life researching Captain Orton, my whole life, or and enjoy it, and completely yeah, I mean, absolutely enjoy. It. I mean, there's things I found out. I was like, wow, that's incredible. You know, yeah. you know, I can't remember it now, but like how to how yeah. to use um, you know, the um, look that the telescope or that yeah, the oh. one with, I can't even remember the name of it, but the <laughs> the um the one that they use for the navigation and stuff. You know, right. okay. things like that. You know what you know what what they ate on board i think i used to talk uh, it was um nick nick lenny you did um you yeah. did uh, one of the the, the swing episode with right. nick would nick would occasionally be the soul the sailor it was it was more often Stephen hardcastle yeah. but i always made a point of i never would you know we had a bit of banter there that the audience never heard right and i always made a point of making sure we stayed in context right and i found out as much as i could about you know what kind of food they would eat you know and, right. and 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 you know amazing things you could go wow that's incredible that's really amazing you find out you know sailors used to eat like s loads and like like twenty thousand calories a day i, I it's, it wasn't that but it's something really massive I mean, right, right, right. because their lives they were doing so much work you know up and down the rigging you know they never stopped working you know the the the, the bell system you know how the timing of the bell system worked because i never understood that you know go what is it eight bells what does it mean how's it all work you know and they they do a bell on every i think it's half hour i think it is um you know things things like that that you just go it's so enriching and so fulfilling to find out stuff like that and i'm just i and i've always been really hungry to find out about things so there's no better job than being an actor because you just don't stop finding out because every role is different and i've played everything from serial killers to to you know the husband next door right. to you know sea captains to you know um detectives and 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 it, it's fantastic you know that that that's what really uh you know keeps me inspired and keeps me going so beautiful this is why i love talking to phil yeah <laughs> all right let's talk about this let's talk about the science of acting yeah um, you said that you had um like a little you can do something that you're going to give this book away oh yeah right so up up and coming i've got next month i mm -hmm. and, and really inspired by you i can have to say because you you're in you've got all the social media thing going on with the and doing things like this and um, which i've been looking at for a while you know zoom yeah. classes and stuff and i do have a student in la that i teach uh, privately and we do it on zoom um the, the classes and stuff and uh, and i thought you know what i really should do like a free workshop for the science of acting because i talk you know i've, I've said it on you on this i said you know every actor should know about it and really i'm i you know there's only quite a there's a limited amount of people that teach it and know enough about it to be able to talk about it and i've done workshops and, and lectures all over the 
country i i, I did one in la as well wow. and um and i thought now i've got to do one online because everything's moving online um at the moment particularly so there's one plan for next month the date's not confirmed but i'm going to do a free introductory workshop to the science of acting okay. um the date will be published on my social media feeds with twitter instagram um I, I need to start a youtube channel i don't have one at the moment why don't you shout out your um your handles for twitter and instagram so we can uh, twitter's at philip bullcock uh instagram philip bullcock if you just put in philip bullcock uh, you will find me and um and i will put the date up as soon as i have it and and it will be in a format like this and one person that attends if you i'll put an email up as well like a contact email right. and you register there and then I'll pick someone out of the hat that attends it. You know, you actually have to attend the, uh, the, the session and uh, I'll give that book away to the person that gets picked out of the hat, which is the science of acting handbook that was written by Sam Kogan and, um, and uh, contribute a lot of contributions in there from, from his students as well. Yeah. me being one of them and also there's some stuff in there that, that somehow got a bit mistranslated in in or, or misconstrued in the writing of it so i'll 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 make sure that i send you the 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 uh, footnotes corrections because there's some corrections that need yeah. to be made in there so okay so is this open to anyone and everyone and yeah how? yeah absolutely i mean whether whether you're just you just want to find out a little bit about you know you're just curious about the acting industry and uh, different acting techniques or you're a seasoned professional um or you're at drama school or you want to go to drama school or you, you want to be an actor or you don't want to be an actor it, it really everybody it's a fact as i say it, it's a fascinating body of knowledge and it and it it taught me some things that just make life on the whole uh a lot more kind of uh what's the word um a lot more transparent in terms of how people act and think because as you said you know it's a lot of it is is very um it's based on understanding the consciousness which is an act it's like why wouldn't you want to do that that's like your job really to understand how your consciousness works so then you can recreate characters consciousnesses because you understand how your consciousness was created um that's your job and it and it and it, 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 it kind of it opens the door you know there's nothing like going and doing real classes of course it doesn't replace doing a course in it but um it certainly is a great introduction to it and as i say i'll be giving away that book free uh, to one of the well, attendees I'm, I'm definitely signing up for that as soon as you let me know i, I have to take you out of the you know i have to take you out, out of the draw joaquin or else people say the fix is in you know if you win it <laughs> you've got it anyway you've got yeah. it i have the book anyway so you you can't you can't yeah, yeah that's right that, 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 that's true. True. so you know what you one thing that always struck me about you is that you never really seem too phased or affected by, you know, when shit hits the fan or when things go really south, you mm. always remain so calm and so sober and very like, I wouldn't say detached, but objective, like very pragmatic about things. And with our yeah. really, you know. Yeah, really, I mean, I think. Yeah, go sorry, ahead. Go on. Our, 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 our industry is really like, uncertain right now and how what goes into your mind right now as an actor and you know as a dad and as a professional uh, yeah i mean i think uh i don't know i mean i think i've got this from maybe you know everyone has milestones that happen in their, their lives i think and, and and they're very uh they have a, a, a kind of profound effect on the way that you think and um i think the whole way i got into the in industry and you know, seeing how really at the, at the end of it, you can blame, you know, as an actor, you can blame so many people that your career is not going the way you want it to go. You didn't get this audition, you didn't get that audition. And, and it's, you know, th there's no point in doing that. You know, there's often some really banal reasons why things don't go your way. Um, you know, like you don't know the director, he's worked with somebody else who auditioned before. You know, that's, I've, I've been on the, the, the right end of that you know and work with directors you know i've walked into auditions and say you don't have to do anything phil i know you've worked with you before you've got the job which is brilliant um but sometimes it doesn't you know it happens to somebody else and you don't get the job even though you think you do an amazing you know an amazing audition or whatever and it's for, often for really really silly reasons and i think i know and i don't want to sound like you know arrogant i know how seriously i take what i what i do and how much um you know how passionate i am about it and how uh how committed to it i am and i think 
the, the thing is, is that I know it's, it, and this is a, this is a lot from the training of the science of acting because it goes into people might know about purposes because Stanislavski talks a lot about purposes. You know, what's the character's purpose? And really, it's your purpose. It's your purposes as an individual that that take your life where it's going to be. It's very rarely anybody else that's you're a victim of circumstances or anybody else. It's up to you to think what you want to think to get through those situations. So yeah, COVID and the fact that theatres you know closed down and won't be open for a long time sucks. You know it does. But I've got to go right. Okay, so how what do what what do my purposes need to be if I want to be frustrated? Mm. If I want to um, you know if I want to despair that's what I'll do. If I want to say, well, this might open up some new opportunities. I've got to look for new opportunities. Then, then that, that's a totally different mindset that you're, that you're giving yourself for how you handle the situation. And I think as actors, you, you know, you, you go through so much adversity yeah. that you have to learn that pretty quickly, that it's, it's up to you what you think about it. And rather than getting despondent about, you know, I've been for so many auditions, I've done so many self tapes that I didn't get. Yeah. Um, you know and and you just have to go well it's just a matter of time you just keep on going you've got to keep um for one of a more specific ex explanation positive you know you've got to keep positive and uh, and it's really down to your purposes you know it's down to what you want to do you know one of the first things i did was i called my i got a voiceover agent and and that was luck but i always think luck comes from endeavor you know if you're out there doing it you're more susceptible to being lucky and I changed agents like I've had a lot of agents, you know, n n not because I've got up and gone, I, I don't want this agent anymore, but, you know, things have happened. I've had agents go bankrupt. I've had agents, um, you know, pass away. I've had agents, um, you know, have huge political explosions happen within the offices and then they have to get rid of clients. Yeah. You know, I had some real bad luck with agents. But then I, I joined one um, uh, agent who just happened to have a friend who was starting a voiceover agency and just recommended mm -hmm. me. And from the and from the everybody knows my name, the film that I'd done because I'd done it on thirty five mil. A lot of really important figures in post production wanted to get involved with it. So Roger, who was the DOP, who I talked about on Everybody Knows My Name, he he talked about a guy called Andre Jackerman, and said this guy is an amazing sound designer. Go and see him, explain the project, and I did. And um, and Andre said it's on film, so yeah, I really want to be involved. And it turned out Andre was um, sound designer for every Monty Python film that's ever been. Wow. He, his business partner is Michael Palin. And and he got me in the studio saying, you know, he ring me up one day. Yeah, Phil, can you come down and do a couple of voices for, uh, I've got Terry Gilliam's film, Zero Theorem, and I need a couple of voices. Oh, my God. And I say, yeah, okay. And I, I, I go down and he'd show me the latest edit he's doing because he's doing the sound design to it. And, he's, you know, show me the film. You know, this is, you know, months before it came out at the cinema or anything and uh and then i ended up going to the screening and terry's there and i i went to the screening of uh the film he did uh Don the donkey 80 film he's just done yeah. um adam driver. uh yeah the one with adam driver yeah and i met him we went went to the loo after the film and he was, he was in the loo and we had a conversation about it and my thoughts on the film and and that was really really nice and uh lovely guy with Terry Gilliam and the Lou is yeah yeah it was me Andre and Terry yeah I think I was washing my hands and uh, I think Andre was uh, having a pee and Terry was uh, hand dryer we were having a conversation about it yeah it was oh my god a nice moment but th that was that you know that that's lucky lucky that I well not lucky but in a way I'd done that film that's why you should get out there and do things and and, and I, I have to tell myself that sometimes it's very easy to go or oh, you know what will happen if I do this, you know, if it goes wrong and, and, and look at it, what might go wrong, but you just gotta, you've just gotta chuck that to one side and go, I'm, I'm doing it. You know, I'm going to do this and, um, and get out there and do it. And, and, and generally from endeavor, particularly if you put a lot of care into it and a lot of conscientious thought and work goes into it so that you end up with a good product. You know, if you, if you, if I'd made everyone knows, knows my name and it'd been a lot of rubbish, I don't think people wanted to be involved in it, but because from the get go, I, I was really set on, on, you know, this is going to be out there for the rest of my life. I don't want people looking at it and going, that's yeah. like mediocre, you know, there's mistakes in it. It's not perfect, yeah. but I want people to look at it and go, you know, that guy can direct, you know, that guy is, uh, has, has, uh, has done a, a reasonably good job here. And from that, as I say, I got to know Andre. Andre got me into those voices. And then when this agent that I'd signed with said his friend was putting up um, a starting a voiceover agency, 
um she said well have you done anything and i said well actually yeah i have i've done this and this and this she said, oh, i'll meet with you then met with her got on her books and and uh, and so i'm doing voiceover stuff and that was a combination of purpose and luck coming from purpose and um and yeah and the voiceover stuff is you know it's, it's an incredibly hard thing to break into um but once you're in it it can be it's madly lucrative um it's very cyclical you know you can have really good years and then not so good years which has kind of happened to me but um but a lot of fun and then this this the whole reason i've got this mic is because obviously sorry about that background noise someone's decided to i don't know what they're doing out there but if you can hear it like chainsawing their boat apart or something i don't know um but um yeah the uh the reason i got this was because in lockdown we couldn't go into the studio so you had to make a studio on your own right. or for me on a boat so i i i bought that i got some advice from andre's um um from andre himself and his daughter who's a dj and, and uses this mic as well she's a vocalist too a really good singer and i got this mic and i got you know pot screen and I, I had the mic stand and everything so that i could record from home and i've done a i've done a job from home you know and you just have to find the opportunity and go I, you know i was thinking the other day, what other opportunities are there? maybe i should train as a stunt driver you know maybe that, that's a good thing maybe that because obviously now acting work in any any medium yeah. i imagine is going to get very competitive yeah. so the more things you can do you know I, I can speak german that's very very useful for right. i've done i've acted in german which is great um but my german you know it, it it gets very rusty so i've you know i've been hitting geo geolingo and you know on the berlin the website and stuff trying to you know get my german back up to scratch and just looking where where the opportunities how can i make uh, myself more employable and 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 more right for more roles i mean i think i think that's what really separates the men from the boys i mean that's what makes you a genuine and really authentic and passionate artist is that you don't discriminate work because no. work is work and you find you find the opportunity to get fulfilled from whatever kind of work that comes your way yeah no I, I, absolutely and and i think as well you know i'm writing a script and everyone's writing a script but i'm writing a script and that is that's great and my wife um as uh she's down she's got on this master class thing you have you've heard of that right the 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 whole thing with um um because she she wrote something when we lived in la she wrote like a series and uh, and had people look at it and they, they were very encouraging about it they never did anything with it but you can watch like writers like Shonda Rhimes who wrote oh, yeah. Masterclass yeah, Master yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've been watching that, you know, and um, you know, David Mamet's on there. Who, who I my graduation play from uh, the Science of Acting was one of his plays, American Buffalo, um, and just trying to learn as much as you can, and um, and and yeah, and just keep keep aug augmenting your your knowledge, and uh, and also you know we, we we thought we were limited on the boat you know we can't film on the boat but actually when we designed it i designed it with the windows in certain places to be able to to film particularly we were going to do a cooking show on on board which you know we had we had a child and that kind of <laughs> that, that does knock things to one side a little bit but all these things we will do and you know annabelle was on there the day, so the, the light's amazing here it's like really good light and we did a little scene for this um commercial i was talking to you about yeah. before we went live yeah and um she said the light's incredible. I said, I said, yeah, I know I designed it to be like that. <laughs> we just forgot. Yeah. And, uh, but and, anyway, and we filmed this self-tape for this commercial, which was a whole like production. Yeah. And and we realized, yeah, we can shoot on the boat. It actually was really good place to shoot, you know, even right. though you're limited to space. And so we start like, you know, bouncing ideas off each other, like film ideas. And, you know, I don't think there's been a feature film on an narrowboat, And there should be because it's a very interesting space. Definitely. Yeah. so uh, yeah so that that's it you, yeah i mean you just gotta be um be thinking about things all the time and and, and be creative and and um and, and have an out outlet for your creative um ideas and and um and creative purposes yeah i, I always tell edgy this that every time i walk away from talking to you i feel like a better person like it's just so i feel i feel more energized in my work and my that's passion. good maybe i should do i should do like some kind of like actor specific life coaching oh, you, you know just, just actors only go listen it's it's fine this is what you gotta do <laughs> you you'd make a killing out of it i i tell you to be honest um yeah. thank you phil uh, thank you philip it's so uh, it's just always such a pleasure and i my respect for you grows deeper and deeper every time
and yeah, oh, one, once once we're free to move more um, freely around the city, I'm I can go visit and take some vegetables from the allotment. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and we'll get together. And um, you know, it, I'm inspired by you, and and you know, it, you're a different generation from me, but obviously, you're embracing the whole online thing and i think this this is a great idea and um and and you know i've really enjoyed talking to you i always enjoy talking to you and and um you know uh anytime anytime yeah thank you i um, love my love to annabelle and otis yeah and my love to Aji. and um what's the name of the cat i see the cat what's the cat's name well we've officially christened her caper caper yeah, and uh, we're not sure. She, she she decides to come and visit, and she decides to leave. Everything is on her terms. But I think yeah, that's cat. Yeah, yeah. What are you gonna do? A, a, a very good amount of luck and blessing, and I think um, yeah. And I told you a little bit more. I told you a little bit about that before we went on. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and 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 absolutely, I think it's fully deserved, and I think you're a a, a bright future ahead, and. Um, anytime yeah you want to talk about anything or oh, definitely and, and, and hopefully we'll see each other very soon and uh, always a pleasure i'll hold you up on to that okay, okay. thank you very much that's it for the talk i hope you guys learned something uh because i definitely did i'm going to save this all of this goes to my youtube channel and you can re-watch it and share it and just feel a little bit better about yourself after um, I'll keep everybody updated on the workshop that Philip is going to be conducting on the signs of acting. Thank and you. If you are a lucky uh, name out of the hat, you get to take home this manual, which I think is absolutely a game changer. I personally can vouch for it as well. So thank you, Philip. I'll see thank you. Thank you soon. very much. Thanks, Joaquin. Goodbye. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.